The Bible says in the last days there will be doctrines of devils, 1 Timothy chapter 4. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. So it's important to know that in these last days we are to be aware of what Satan's doing to corrupt our world and we are so that we don't fall prey into his system. Now, one of the things concerning about the last days you've got to understand is that it doesn't matter how much research they pull up. Now, this is going to be very eye-opening concerning about research as well as empirical evidence. And I give kudos and compliments to my liberal schools, actually. So this one is very eye-opening and was very helpful to me for strengthening Christianity. You got to understand. So this was going to be extremely helpful. And this is going to be a basis for all of you. So basically, I'm giving you a little bit of my secret on how to win arguments, so to speak. So this will be very helpful to you. Okay, now concerning about research and empirical evidence, what you've got to understand is this, is that there is one thing that cannot be separated, and God has always warned about this. Before I write that word down, though, what it is, let's look at what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 7. I love this verse. Ever learning, see that? So they can study in school as much as they want. They can research as much as they want. They can pull up as many hypotheses as much as they want through observation and scientific experiments. Ever learning and what? Never able to come to the knowledge of the what? Truth. That is extremely important. So what's important to understand is that concerning research and empirical evidence, you can go up and up and up and up, like out of the board. You can go really high on this one. But then concerning truth, what the Bible says concerning truth right here, they're not even close to it. Ever learning and never even coming to the truth. Truth is like up to here. Now remember this concerning about uh, academia and schools. And not only that, also learn that this is as well applicable to different churches and religions and heresies and including online stuff as well, all right? So this is covering everything from religion, from what you're looking at the internet, from what you're hearing from teachers in schools and preachers in churches, and etc. There's always truth in their statements, but look how small it is, right? So that's an element of truth. That's how they work. It's always an element of truth. It's not a flat-out lie. The Bible says is that they can ever learn, see, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Now, why is that the case? Because this is the one word that you'll see right here. It's called, and I notice this with debates and arguments, everyone has this problem, bias. Now, what is bias coming from? Bias, it comes from your heart, the sincerity, see, of your heart. You know, sometimes we wonder, why can't God give a clear-cut verse that can expose the heresy, that can prove our teaching to be right? Do you know why he doesn't do that? He's all about testing from the heart. That's how God is. That book, you got to understand, is a two-edged sword. What it can do is that it can deceive you. That's right. That book can deceive you, or it can enlighten you to the truth. Amen. You know why? Because God does this to test your heart, how much your heart is sincere in handling the Word of God. Now, the greatest evidence you can think of is the Word of God. Amen? Now, think about this. That's considered evidence. With these two things, they hold it in their hands. So they do, this is important to understand, they do have empirical evidence. They do have the research in their hands. But just because you have the evidence, you can manipulate it. You can misinterpret it. You can mishandle it and teach something totally wrong. I mean, this, this is rock solid in evidence, it's full proof, amen? But can you teach something wrong from this? Yes. 
We documented it. Harvard University examined it through 500 participants. And then we looked at it through three different measures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, great. They got the evidence. But can they manipulate that? Can they misuse it, misinterpret it? Yes. Because there is one thing in research that they do not deny. So when they do research, so I studied uh, how to validate and critique research. So I had to make up my own, you know, those little st weird statistics, equations, and all that kind of stuff, believe it or not. So I had to learn all that kind of weird, st stupid little stuff like that. But I'm glad that I did. It was very useful. So in research methods, what they teach you is three ways to uh, critique measurements. It's construct validity, internal validity, as well as external validity. But excluding all those things, let me just cut to the point right here. Cutting to the point right here is that what's amazing is that they try to cover all bases to cover the weaknesses in the experiments, to cover the threats to the experiment. Because um, when you take research and empirical evidence, believe it or not, there are more than 12 or uh, 12 different threats. No, there's 12 to 20, 30, probably like that as many, like maybe 20 or more different threats to research and empirical evidence. It's a lot. Internal threats is consisting of 12, 12 or more probably. So the thing is, is that there are many threats to it. Now, when they do their research, they covered all the bases almost. You know, They cover a lot of the bases. But this is important to remember. So when the news media, OK, this is important to understand, which will be helpful. When the news media starts to quote you some kind of article, well, let's not just take the news media as well. Let's put them in parentheses. Anything that has to do with media, Anything that has to do with uh, your teachers, what they teach. So let's put teaching here. So what is media, folks? It's not just news. It's what you watch online as well. The stuff on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Teaching. What is in teaching? Well, schools, obviously. Well, it's not just schools, too. It's including churches. Amen. I'm glad that you're all agreeing here, see? You're not coming here just as robots, see? So, but it's not just schools and churches. There's a lot of other propaganda as well from people. Uh, government, I'm sure we can all agree with that one, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah government, yeah. Yeah, we all, I'll say amen to that any day, Pastor. Yeah. I'll say that, yeah. I'll say that. <laughs> Especially the government, we can all agree with that one. <laughs> but the thing is this, is that when they're giving the media and the teaching tells you something, they're going to mention a source. They're going to mention there's a group of scientists that took this experiment and blah, 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 blah. So what you need to do is this. What you need to do is to take that source and look it up directly. Now, when you look it up directly and read it, OK, skip through all the scientific jargon and then come to the discussion point. When you come to the discussion point, that's the point where they have to mention their weaknesses. They have to. Otherwise, they won't be publicizing their research. So in the discussion area, that's where they mention their weaknesses. And then when you look at the weaknesses, then you see right here, you know, they, the news media never mentioned this part. They never mentioned this part. Now, the reason why they will still publicize it anyway is because what they want to do is uh, they want to go by what's uh, most val uh, when you're weighing the evidence. And when you weigh the evidence, then you can start using it. But the thing is, is that nevertheless, a threat is a threat. And a threat, it can overturn everything. And here is one threat that I see most of the time, which interested me. This is a threat that is mostly mentioned in all the research. So I mentioned there's a lot of weaknesses, right? But the threat that they mentioned the most, which was surprising to me, you wouldn't believe it, folks. It's called observer bias. Do you know why? Because they say it's very possible because the researchers already have an idea of what the experiment is. They may have moved the situation and the circumstance to fit their conclusion. It has to be completely random to validate research. 
So in order to do that, they recommend double blind study. That's what they call it, a double blind study. Now the thing is this, is that this was very interesting to me that this was like one of the number one things that a lot of the, res uh, a lot of the research will admit as the weakness. So it's like, can you really trust what they're saying when you have 80% of teachers in schools who are liberals in real statistics? That's valid, real statistics there. Okay, even the, uh, let me give a Democratic uh, newspaper source, all right? You know, the, the, the Democratic uh, newspaper source, the Washington, they even admitted, they themselves confessed that a huge percentage are liberals, professors in schools. Now, who's handling your research then? Now, think about this too. How emotional are liberals compared to uh, Christians or even conservatives who are in the wrong too? Conservatives who are in the wrong. Who are more, who are more emotional people? Hmm. Yeah. Or angry, right? Yeah. So when there's like a lot of emotion involved, yeah, see that? A lot of, see, the heart is the issue. There's a lot of emotion involved. What do you tend to do with this after that? Okay, now look at 2 Thessalonians 2. So God is never wrong. Well, you know, if I can find research and evidence for it, if I can find a logical argument to it. No, that's God, he knows what happens at the end. It doesn't matter how strong your research is. It doesn't matter how strong your logical argument is. It doesn't change the fact this is the issue. See, it all comes down to your heart how you emotionally feel. And God, he does that to test you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, chapter 2, and let's look at verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the what? Love of the truth. Did it say truth or love of the truth? Love. Love of the truth. That they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong, what? Delusion, that they should, what? Believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow. See that? They prefer their own belief. That's their problem. Here's one more term that I want to talk about, okay? Now, Dr. Shermer, he talked about this thing called confirmation bias. How many of you have heard of that? So in other words, you want to, uh, a lot of people, they're pattern-seeking people. They are pattern-seeking people. So when they see a certain pattern, they'll connect the dots and they'll come up with a conclusion. So like, for example, is that if, they, if you look at a tree, okay, and it looks like a face pattern in there in that tree, and then you pick somebody in the room that has a similar face like that, then you're a pattern-seeker. And then you can come up with the conclusion that this guy, you know, this guy is probably Nephilim and is born from that tree trunk. <laughs> that was the fun thing to say, yeah. But you see, that's the thing. You have to be careful with what you watch online. And you also have to be careful. This is so funny. You also have to be careful with schools, too. They don't tell you that. They're pattern-seeking people. And they come up with a conclusion. Every time Shermer was talking about that, I was like, you know what I was thinking all that time? I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you. You know why? This guy, Shermer is an atheist. And he believes in evolution. Evolution, how do they prove their theory? It's not proof. It's pattern seeking. So what they do is that because they see this certain animal that has little similar structures between a zebra or a horse or something, they're pattern-seeking people. So they go into la-la land and fantasy that this, this animal switched to a zebra eventually through millions of years, and then millions of years later it switched to, what, a horse or something like that. See, pattern-seeking people. I was laughing all the time. I was not thinking conspiracy theories when he was talking. He was talking about conspiracy theories, actually, which was true, or Christianity, which is true. And you already saw me put that up. This is everything. I'm, I'm against all lies, folks. I don't care what the source is. I'm against all lies, see? But I wasn't thinking about church or, or online or conspiracies or whatnot. I was actually thinking about evolution every time he was talking. I was like... 
I almost said amen every, after every <laughs> sentence he talked about. I almost said amen after every sentence. I was like, that's you. You know what's very troubling to me? He should know evolution, and he knows deep about this pattern stuff. I wonder when he's studying evolution, he thinks about that. Yeah, see? Now, here's the best way to how you get on atheists and evolutionists. They will always say evidence, evidence, prove, prove, prove. But that's not true. So, uh, actually, in research language, you can't say prove. Some of them are against saying prove, actually. Even if you pull out empirical evidence and research, because they know there's a lot of threats. So, whenever the atheist critiques you when you pull up evidence, because we're about yay, yay, nay, nay, proof or no proof, right? That's how we talk. So the atheists, they use that kind of language to you to understand. Cults and different heresies and uh, people you argue against, it doesn't matter who they are. They're gonna, you're going to catch them saying this. When they say this next time, all you have to do is mention it doesn't matter if you have the evidence for that. Bias can change everything. Here's an actual case and example. Two cases. One, remember the, uh, the FBI investigation into Trump? So this is just current event recent. So when the FBI investigation came out against Trump, what was so interesting is that, uh, so Trump's case was pretty much uh, covered up. It was pretty much in the clear. So then the Republicans say that the Federal Bureau, they did a satisfying investigation. They did a good job. They were thorough. Yeah. After reading the actual research and empirical evidence, okay? The Republicans said that uh, it was good research. You know what the Democrats said? It was unsatisfying. There are a lot of loopholes. Now think about this. This is the eye-opening part. If this is truly provable and it had everything, why did people, and these people are smart, they have degrees, they wouldn't be in office, okay, if they weren't that intelligent, how did they come up to two totally different conclusions with the same evidence that they had in their hands. It's called bias. How about that? That's why, whether you like it or not, evolution is faith. Sure, creationism is faith too. We, and creationists don't deny that. But evolution is faith too. It's not provable. When they say it's provable, it's scientific, it is absolutely not. Because the thing is, is that when you take the scientific um, data, creationists will interpret it as something catastrophic that gave a quick date, or some intelligent design that just made it come out like that. That's their argument, so intelligent design. Whereas the evolutionists, when they see the scientific data, they'll see it as like a millions or billions of years age, or they'll see some kind of natural selection process. But how did those two groups come up to totally different conclusions with the same data? It's called? Bias. Now, the thing is this, is that, OK, how do we get rid of this bias? And it was so hilarious. All these students were like saying, how do I get rid of this? And they were serious, too. They were like saying, it's like, like a dust statement. I never thought of that before. Yeah, because you're in the liberal millennial world. You weren't using your brain all that time. And it wasn't until grad school then you start to realize, oh, wow, I've got to fix this issue. Didn't God tell you, taught you a long time ago? You guys who don't have PhDs, let alone a BA, you're just some dumb hillbilly with a Bible, right? They already told you a long time ago. Some dumb hillbilly you are, right? Yeah, you, you're way ahead than those grad school students. And they paid lots of money for that. You only paid 99 cents for a King James Bible from a Dollar Tree store. Hilarious, man. I always laugh, yeah. Now, the thing is this, though, is that they came up with one good point. The reason why they will let the research go and stand, so bias cannot be escaped no matter what. There is always an element of faith that cannot be escaped. Thus, we walk by faith, not by sight. See, you can have all the sight you want, but see, it will uh, it's going to come up to different face after that. It will never change that fact. So the thing is, though, is that faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that doesn't mean, though, that there is no such thing as right and wrong. Uh, there is, uh, what was I about to say? Basically, that faith has no evidence. That's not what it means, though. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith has evidence. 
But remember, just because you have evidence, there is still faith somewhere. See, it doesn't change that fact. You can have the evidence, but it still doesn't change the fact that you have faith somewhere. And you can have faith somewhere or a bias somewhere, and then you can pull up evidence for that. It doesn't matter. But look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the what? Evidence of things not seen. Okay? So there is faith somewhere. So here's the point. This is what scientists, researchers do. So that's why they don't believe in an absolute right or wrong answer. But by saying that, they already believe in an absolute. <laughs> They're saying there's no such thing as right and wrong. Well, how can you be absolutely certain of that? Then? <laughs> See? So it doesn't change. See, everyone has faith somewhere. It doesn't change that fact. Everyone has faith somewhere. But the point is this. The point is, is that what researchers, clever people do, people who are into critiquing and, and pulling up evidence is, is they weigh the evidence. Now remember, in research, it has a lot of threats in it, right? If those threats are mentioned and covered, that strengthens the research, right? Yeah. I would like to close proving our Christianity with this. What religion do you know of? What book do you know of was critiqued intensely and heavily? People trying to find as much criticisms against it, and yet it was always justified, it was always given logical answer, mathematical answer, historical answer, scientific answer. Name me any book in the entire world. Name any religion in the entire world that had that much weight. You don't want to say it. It's Christianity. It's your King James Bible. Why don't they do that with Islam? Homosexuality? Liberals with their global warming thing? Why don't they do that much? That way they can... Yeah, why can't they do that? Why can't they do that to strengthen their research? So it seems to show more and more that there may be more of this than covering the weak bases to validate it. By the way, the Bible, now I know why the Bible doesn't say a lot of things clearly. And it, uh, sometimes it shows seeming contradictions and all that. You know why? God wants you to work on it yourself. Yeah. He wants you to work it on yourself to see your heart. That proves more of the validity that it's evidenced, is that you yourself search it out. You yourself handle it. You yourself use your own logical reasoning, and you yourself come to your own conclusion what you think from that book. There is no other book like it. There is no other religion like it. Think about it. As much as the criticisms that were aimed toward Christianity, if we move that toward liberalism, Islam, Catholicism, Charismatic doctrine, etc. How weak and uh, feeble do you think those things will stand compared to our faith? Weak. This is gonna be, yep, that's right. It's going to be weak, and we're going to stand on top. So actually, you should be thankful that these atheists are doing your homework to find the critiques and weaknesses for you, the threats for you. You can just sit back and let them troll and yak all they want, and then you just study the book and you find the answer to that. Yeah, they're doing, they're, they're covering all the threats for you. I don't, what if your religion is wrong? Don't worry, you'll cover it for me on what's wrong. You'll show me what's wrong with it. And then I'll look at it myself and find out what's wrong. <laughs> but, but sometimes, you, some, now you have to ask them this, why don't you do the same thing? Why can't you use, so this is what uh, is strong against bias we learned in school. Try to disprove it. Try to find a contradiction. When you do that, you're going to find all the weaknesses and see if that research and empirical evidence stands. So let me just write this down and then I'll close. I talked a long time on this. I didn't think I'd talk this long. Okay. But contra find contradictions. Find the weakness. That's how you validate and strengthen the research. And you know if the research and the evidence is good or not. But you see, they don't seem to do that uh, with Islam, with Catholicism. They don't seem to do that with liberalism or their own doctrines. But they sure do a good job of that in Christianity, don't they? So because they kept finding contradictions for us, we know that our research is strengthened. We know that our evidence is what? The authority of our faith. Yeah, amen. amen. All right, I hope that this teaching was a blessing to you.